Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent. Well, welcome to the amphitheater stage here at the Corning Museum of Glass. This is a very, very special show. This will actually be, this is not the <laughs> Tiffany show. This is actually our live stream of Lewis Olson. There we go. So let's give Lewis a big round of applause, even though he's hard at work already. There we go. Lewis will be assisted by G. Brian Jook over there on the doors. Let's give G a round of applause. And keep that applause going for Lewis's other assistant, Helen Tagler. My name is Rebecca Potash. I'll be over here narrating, maybe hopping in if we need an extra set of hands. We also have Eric and Amanda helping to run the feeds for the live stream. Uh, so one more big round of applause for the entire team. Throughout this show, feel free to clap if you see anything you like. And if you see anything you don't like, uh, you can keep that to yourself. <laughs> So here we go. Lewis has actually pre-started this piece. Uh, you can see my best sketch, having never gone to art school, of what this final product will look like over here on the whiteboard. I told Lewis, he saw the sketch, started laughing. I said, hey, I set the bar really low for you, Lewis, so you should thank me for my mediocre <laughs> drawing abilities. There he is. Hey, Lewis, he looked up for a second. Now, Lewis is a very focused glass maker. So he's going for this really intricate spiral pattern. And the component he's building right now is the part I've drawn in blue. Now, this uh, bit Lewis is working with right now, it's mostly clear. It has a kind of general wash of purple on the inside. There we go. A wash of an ambery pink on the outside. And then it also has a threaded two-tone wrap on it. So there's a lot of color in here. Now, I was talking with Lewis earlier today. He is our most experienced glass maker on staff here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Lewis started blowing glass in his uh, homeland of New Zealand in the 1970s. And he's just such a skilled glass maker, we had to import him. We had to get him on the team. <laughs> So Lewis started blowing glass in the 1970s. The town he grew up in had a studio that focused on lighting production, so making lampshades and various lighting installations. And Lewis went there when he was uh, back in high school, looked around the studio, and got instantly mesmerized, as maybe some of you today are just watching this uh, truly uh, magical and seductive material. Lewis went there and he said, he just watched them all day as long as he could and finally went up to someone and asked if they would hire him and they said, no, sorry, kid. And as he was leaving, someone got his number, one of the people working there and called him two days later, had him try out and he joined the team. He said within a couple of days, he was actually already making production vessels. Typically, if you learn in a production shop, your first couple of days, you're simply sweeping the floors and watching. They put Lewis at the bench very rapidly. He said he would go home at night and practice turning simply using a broom handle. So Lewis was really uh, committed to this from an early age and is still incredibly committed to the art of glass making. Helen is over at our garage now. She's picked up the curl Lewis previously made during the day. We're going to mate those two together it's always difficult bringing two bits of glass together as glass is fragile, especially when there's a big temperature differential in the material. So we need to make sure that both pieces are of close to equal temperature. And where they meet needs to be a little extra hot. Where the glass is hot, it will stick and fuse. It's a very, very careful balancing of heats. You can see Lewis delicately sculpting those beautiful curls. And you can see both of them just doing what we call a price check, kind of taking a peek, not really sticking them together yet, just looking, deciding if he has to sort of uh, change, change the shape of one of them so they match up nicely. 
It's what we call a price check. And earlier I said these have a wash of color in them. Lewis took a little bit of transparent glass and kind of dripped it along one side of his bubble, and then twisted that, and this transparent glass was added very early on in a very thin layer. And as it blows out, it will be kind of a, a very faint wash of color. All of the color Lewis is working with came in the form of color bar. So he wants a nice uniform color. Over here, we have sections of this bar. This might be that Aurora color Lewis is so fond of. And over here, we have a, a copper blue. So we buy it in dense sections. And then as it blows out, it thins. So getting those little twins lined up right next to each other. Lewis uses a natural, it's an oxypropane torch to really spot heat those parts he wants to tack together. He wants to make sure both sides are hot and if anyone's practiced uh, soldering, you want to kind of preheat the area you're soldering. Helen there with the gloves, just in case one of them gets a little stressed out by this transfer. Sticking that on, really fusing them. And then not only having to break one punty, but break two. You're pretty ambitious. So he holds it with the um, straight shears, and a little tap breaks that free. There we go, straightening that out, aligning them with a shape that must be really difficult to turn. That's very off center right now, so he's gonna have to, a lot of torque to turn that. He's working off of a kind of thin pipe. So even though he only has, I don't know, two pounds of glass at the end of that pipe right now, it's gonna really work his hands to keep that turning. Just so for that little flash to balance that heat. And you can see this beautiful symmetry. I think Lewis did a, Amazing job, probably even surprised himself at how well those bottom curls lined up. He had to make the second component blind. When he made the first one, it went into the garage, and he was saying to himself, oh, I wish I'd taken a picture of that, or more measurements with the calipers. You saw him sizing that up with those caliper tools earlier on. But he did a really impressive job getting that all perfectly aligned. Now, we are live streaming this show, so if anyone sees this and thinks, oh, my friend back home would love to see it, shoot him a message. You can go on to cmog.org and watch this play out. This will also be saved and put onto our website later on. So it's just giving that that kind of final eye. Helen supporting it with the gloves. As I said, this is a very uh, sort of delicate connection. For our punties, we want them attached, but not so hard that it will never come off, especially because it's sort of at a bit of an angle. Very, very delicate situation we're working with right now. So that's why we have G, you can see. Really, even how he puts that piece down on the yoke, where it will support the pipe when he goes back into the heat, you can see he just almost barely taps it down on the yoke. We don't want to generate too much vibration in the system, for that can cause the punty to release prematurely. So here we go, Helen bring over a little more glass. This will likely be a bit of a connection button that they'll punty off of later on. There we go, right in the middle, cutting that free. So whenever we add these extra bits of glass, it's kind of like an anchor point on the vessel. We're actually gonna flip this around. If you look at his, uh, or his sketches earlier on, he needs a sort of place to center it down into this form he'll be creating. Earlier he was saying he's hoping to make that outer curvature four gathers, which is a lot of glass. We're glad we have two assistants on this team. When we measure how big pieces are in the hot shop, we rarely talk in pounds because as I said earlier, it's only two pounds of glass maybe. It doesn't sound nearly as impressive as the piece actually is. We typically talk in gathers. So how many gathers of glass, how many times have you had to dip into the furnace, just as Helen is right now, to spool up more material? So a little more about Lewis Olson, our 
Gaffer featured today on the live stream. Lewis grew up in New Zealand, and he spent a lot of time running around outside. Lewis enjoys his long walks on the beach and uh, running around in the rainforest, where native New Zealand, where he grew up. New Zealand back in the 70s said it was kind of an isolated place, especially from the rest of the glass uh, industry. So when he found his factory, uh, the factory in his hometown and went and got a job there, it was an amazing experience. He learned a lot. A lot of the glassmakers he learned from were Swedish descent. The most common uh, style of glassmaking internationally, everyone's kind of inspired by the Italian style of working. Occasionally you will see Swedish, Scandinavian, or uh, a little bit of Czech, kind of other places. But Lewis was definitely trained kind of in the Swedish style. Although he was originally trained in the Swedish style by those people working in New Zealand, he's actually blown glass in Australia, Africa, Canada, the UK, Italy, and Scandinavia, including the United States as well. So he's kind of traveled all over the world, replicating different styles, different techniques. Lewis likes to um, say that uh, finds a way around all these walls. So in his little uh, biography, which sometimes plays here in the museum, he likes to talk about how he never wants to say he can't do it. He always wants to kind of study uh, a process or think of other ways around it. And sometimes, as in glass blowing, just in the rest of life, it's the journey where you really learn the most. So we're going for that punty transfer, flipping this around. We have those two little uh, marks from the punty that is currently on the bench. The cold punty is breaking right now. Light tap, there we go. Yes, thank you, audience. You don't even have to be prompted. You guys get what's going on here today. <laughs> We're going to want to clean up those punty marks. You see, and maybe torch those connections, pull off that extra glass, just make this all really smooth and pristine, uh, cleaning it with each step. So, Lewis has traveled all over the world blowing glass. He was originally, or uh, in the 80s, he was working up in Canada. And not only is Lewis an amazing glass designer, so an artist, a craftsperson, he has incredible uh, hands, he's a very skilled glass maker, but he's also a great glass chemist as well, so Lewis Olson being a bit of a renaissance man. He was working up in Canada and he came down to Corning, New York to visit our Ray Cow Research Library. We actually have a whole library devoted to glass, all aspects of glass and anything related to glass. So if anyone has any questions, their library is currently closed. It closes at, I'm pretty sure, 5 p.m. You can email our librarians or come back another time. Access to the library is free. Come in and perform some research. Lewis was down here researching different glass recipes and uh, sort of fell in love with the glassmaking community here at Corning, New York. Now, as I said earlier, that step you just see, that was him cleaning up that punty connection. So just pulling off that excess, pardon me, clear glass to get that nice smooth uh, curve now. So Lewis came here uh, looking at different glass recipes. So moved to the Corning in 1980s. As I said earlier, uh, we did not actually import Lewis for his glass making skills. He happened to be in Corning already. Uh, big, big win for the museum. Just repeating that process, smoothing out that nice little punty nub. A particular type of punty Lewis is making with, it's what we call a sculpture punty. The word I keep using, punty, is of course this temporary connection we're transferring the piece through. Typically we make a simple dome punty, just a little dome of glass off the tip of a pipe. However, when we're making sculpture punties, we tend to make them a little longer and cut them off later on, like Lewis is right now. There we go. Pulling that little sucker free. The hot glass sticks to hot things, so we gotta be really careful. There we go, a little flick and it came right off. And just again, torching where that glass is pulled and cut. When glass is heated, it has a um, high surface energy and it wants to ball up on itself. So as you heat the glass, it just kind of wants to curl up into a sphere, making it easier to fire polish in any of those tough parts.
As I said, not only does Lewis make glass and design glass, um, or sorry, design glass, he's a glass chemist as well. Lewis sells his glass batch, which is the raw materials we add to go to, into the furnace to make glass, mainly silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. So these are the raw materials that go into glass. Uh, Lewis makes his own glass, he sells it under the Corning Batch Company name. I've actually had the pleasure of working with Lewis's batch. We do not melt it here at the museum. It's designed more for a production application, so it sets up a little faster. So here when we're making these art pieces, we want a really long work time, so we can get all that intricate detail with those curls. If we are making ornaments, paperweights, snowmen, other type of fast production stuff, we'd want it to set up a little more rapidly. So it really works, and then it has a, a quick uh, viscosity curve. It's a shorter glass. So I have worked with the glass Lewis made. It's really, really nice for production work. If you want to work uh, soda lime glass in a factory where they make bottles by machine, you need an even shorter glass because that stuff is coming off the assembly line so quickly. You need those bottles to really instantaneously set up. I was asking Lewis about different colors he's made. What are some of his favorite colors he's ever made? He's made some incredibly difficult colors. He's made some that are striking. Striking is a term meaning the glass, as you work it, starts to change colors, not just from the heat. You can see as he heats it, it goes more orange. As it cools, it dulls down a bit. You know, I mean, when you buy the glass and it's cold, it looks yellow. Heat it for a while, cool it down, it looks red. This is striking. The technical reason things strike is the little color centers in the glass glob together. You get nanoparticle aggregation in the glass, and it changes the color of it. Lewis has made some really beautiful, striking gold rubies, showing he has some very expensive taste. A gold ruby, of course, being a color sort of similar to this this pink right here, not quite, this isn't quite gold ruby, I think this is fuchsia. But it's a very cranberry colored glass. Gold rubies are interesting, they're actually the first instance of humans doing nanotechnology as the little gold spheres suspended in the glass that give it its color. They're only about 40 nanometer, or sorry, 50 nanometers wide, so about one one thousandth the thickness of a human hair. Lewis has done some wonderful job with these gold ruby glasses. Those little nanoparticles really don't want to behave. They want to all gloop together. They're kind of clicky. They just want to hang out with their friends and turn the glass a nasty brown color. So Lewis has done wonderful experimentation and production of his own colors in the past. He also made some adventuring colors. Has anyone ever heard of the gemstone goldstone? It's kind of orangey and it's really sparkly. So people are nodding. That's actually a glass that's actually a venturine glass. It comes in typically blues uh, for blue goldstone, gold colored, or green. And Lewis has made his own venturine colors, which is very, very difficult. You need to create copper or chrome crystallites in the glass. And that's what those little sparkles are. Those are metal flakes precipitating inside the glass. So here we go, Helen babysitting that internal scroll pattern inside our garage. We want to make sure that it goes in there while it's still a little warm. You don't want to send it in too cold where it'll spontaneously crack. The glass we're working with, this soda lime glass right now, is sensitive to thermal shock. And so we want to be sure that we don't put it into a heat source too hot or too cold where it'll crack. But if we were to put it in there too hot and then walk away, it might slump or fall over. So Helen's just watching it as the viscosity slowly increases in the glass, letting it set up, and also being very delicate not to tap that back of the punty, which would cause the glass to break. So while Helen's babysitting that in the garage, her garage typically runs about 10, 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and the burner's only on the far side of it, so we have this close side, which is a little cooler. The far side is a little hotter. So whether we want things to stay longer or we're about ready to pick them up, we move them through the garage. So think of garages like the garage for your car. I know we don't want to think about winter, but if your car is in a garage, you just get in and drive it. 
You don't have to brush the snow off. You don't have to warm it up. Similar to our garage for glass making. If the piece is in our garage, we could just pick it up, give it a quick flash, and bring it back into the mix. G and Lewis now discussing the next plan of attack. They've made that beautiful center portion. And now Lewis is going to go about doing this big external curl. Now Lewis loves working with lots of really bright, jewel tone, transparent colors and seeing how the colors can overlap with each other. We can't really mix glass color the way you'd mix paint. It's just not fluid enough. But you can layer transparence over each other and by looking through, say, a bit of blue and a bit of yellow, you can get green where they overlap and then the blue and yellow where they don't overlap, creating a really, really interesting effect. G, do you know what color you just picked up? Thank you. He gave me the production code for the color he picked up. He just picked up R12, everyone, so you know. He just picked up a reddish amethyst, so a nice uh, reddish purple color, one Lewis uses a lot in his own work. I know, as I said, he has very expensive tastes. He likes using all the gold-based colors, our gold ruby, our auroras, our reddish amethysts. So Lewis, a man appreciating the finer things in life. G picked up that color bar. We have to preheat that color bar because it's a very big chunk. If we were to just take this instantly and try to put it on a hot piece of glass, well, it wouldn't stick. Hot glass only sticks to other hot things. If maybe somehow we got it to stick and we reintroduced it to the furnace, it would explode. If we cool the glass down too quickly, it can crack. If you want to see it really catastrophically fail, that's when we tend to heat it much too rapidly. She's repurposing our pipe warmer to keep that color nice and warm. Picking up on a second pipe, another band of color. So Lewis is starting on this big external curl now. I'm really excited to see him make these. There is, if you go on our website, we have little gaffer profile videos for more experienced gaffers. And Lewis is about a minute long video. And supposedly the rest of the team and our cameraman that night were discussing things. And so Lewis was going for a heat and the camera guy's like, this would be a great angle if I got right there. And the rest of the team's like, Give Lewis his space. You don't know where he's swinging. And supposedly he swung the glass like right in front of the camera. And it was a great shot, but for the rest of the day, camera guy backed off a bit. So I'm excited to see Lewis swing this. He's not only a very skilled glass maker, but someone who's pretty interesting to watch while he works. It's always strange to see yourself on video, to hear your own voice, especially when you're blowing glass because you're so dialed in. Some people they stick their tongue out. Other people, if they're cutting with shears, they chew. That's a pretty common thing. So people kind of wobble their head as they work. That head wobbling seems disorienting, but it's actually them able to kind of look at multiple angles at the piece as they work. We just picked up that fresh, clear gather of glass. This is a soda lime glass we melt here. It's the most common type of glass. Main ingredient, of course, that silica sand, followed by the soda ash and the limestone in about a seven to two to one ratio. We add some other things into glass to clarify it, such as manganese. I learned from Lewis, you can use a little neodymium to keep your glass nice and clear. It's the expensive stuff, though. It's to get really pretty clear glass. Alumina to stiffen it. I've actually learned lots about glass chemistry from Lewis. It's really fascinating talking to him about all that. My background's in chemistry. I actually have a PhD in chemistry, but not glass related. So it's, it's really interesting talking to Lewis and he really understands uh, from a scientific standpoint what all the chemicals do. It's not just that he sort of knows the baking list, but he really, really understands how to make different types of glasses 
and how that comes about in the final piece. And she's got that itty bitty starter bubble in there. Now this is always a really tough thing right now, figuring out who's got what color. <laughs> when the colors are hot, they're all glowing that bright orange red, unless maybe one of them's white, but these jewel tones are going to look exactly the same. So it's very difficult uh, to keep track of who is which color and make sure that they don't mix that all up. Giving the nod from G, they're going to paint that little band of color down the side. This is how Lewis obtained that what I called color wash earlier on, snipping it away and kind of smearing it down. So it's the color pattern Lewis really enjoys. And G's sort of scraping that extra clear off the end of his pipe. He'll probably reuse it to gather again instead of taking the time to preheat it, making a cool little, it's not rocket looking thing. <laughs> So it's going to take some time to melt that in, really smear it around onto the surface. Helen's got that other bit going. I think G had a reddish aurora. Helen has probably copper ruby or some type of amethyst color. Switched. You switched. And um, she's got the 12 and I delivered the 8. Okay, sorry guys. <laughs> G had 8. Helen's now bringing over the 12. Yeah. Just so that's clear for everybody. <laughs> All right, reddish amethyst and yellowish aurora. Sounds good. So these will be some really beautiful uh, sunset tones, I guess would be the best way I'd explain these colors. I was talking with Lewis about the form, and to me it looks um, like many different things. It could look like graffiti. It could look sort of tribal. Sometimes it even looks a little botanical, depending on you know, exact curvature of these shapes. And so Lewis and I were discussing earlier today, you know, what, what's inspiring him? And so he said, growing up in New Zealand, spending a lot of time out in the woods, there are all these beautiful fern heads. And so these ferns, the fiddleheads, the little curl the fern starts with, uh, is a symbol of new beginnings in jade carving. The town Lewis is from is actually world renowned for its jade. Some of the riverbeds near where he grew up had large jade deposits. So New Zealand is actually very well known for its jade carving and that was something I learned today. So when Lewis grew up, he was very inspired by these ferns and all these beautiful things he saw growing up in the lush rainforests of New Zealand and also the jade carving, that local artist community. This feathering pattern he typically decorates these pieces with. Also from the ferns uh, he saw growing up in his home in the countryside of New Zealand. The particular name for this fiddlehead fern leaf in jade carving culture is uh, Karu, K-U-R-U. And as I said earlier, it's a symbol of new beginnings. When Lewis first started working in glass, as many people are, they're sort of imitating other people who came before them, learning the other styles, techniques, trying to find their voice. And so Lewis said he traveled all over the world, trying all these new styles and techniques. And finally, he's at the point where he can really look back on his upbringing, his hometown, kind of came, he said it was like coming around 360 and making his own uniquely distinctive work that is inspired by things he grew up in his own culture. So I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment. And some things many people say you have to travel all the way around the world to find out where home is and all those other nice things on Hallmark cards and bumper stickers. If anyone in the audience has any questions at any point, feel free to holler them out. Also, people at home on the live stream, if you have particular questions about Lewis's process, please uh, give, us, give us a write-in. We're happy to answer them. Yes, holler loud, please.
Yes, the question was about uh, temperature. Our audience member pointed out very uh, correctly that temperature is super important at this process. Uh, he does know it intuitively. There's a little bit of an internal timer we work with. However, that can be disrupted depending on the color of the glass we're working on. Lewis is really going by feel. As he turns the pipe, if the glass gets really hot, it starts to try to fight him and fall off center. And he feels that resistance to rotation as he's heating. He can also pause his rotation slightly. See, so now he's turning really slow. And he'll switch directions, kind of correcting it, letting it fall and come back on center, just to read where that heat is distributed through the material. It's a wonderful question, yes, that it's super important. You know, our temperatures, but we don't have a little infrared camera we're working with this whole time. You can see the glass is glowing. However, the glow is really not how Lewis is judging the temperature. It's a wonderful way to communicate to all of you. The glass is nice and hot and workable. But you can see even between the clear and these two bands of color, clear is barely glowing. And that uh, purpler band, the darker band, is glowing less than the other band, even though it's all about the same temperature right now. So that's very deceptive. I think someone's waving to a friend. I thought there's a question. Question? I'm sorry, sir, you have to speak up. Our question was about mass-produced glass, bottles and jars. Those would be mold-blown nowadays using a machine. So the IS bottle machine is more recent generation. Not sure if it's still the contemporary way bottles are made. But it can push out several bottles per second uh, very, very fast. How those machines work, we have a diagram explaining that in our innovation stage. I think that's actually the... Um, Owens Corning bottle machine, the particular technology that's covering, so an earlier generation. Uh-oh, Lewis is putting on his sleeve. It means he's going to go big. Uh, so those machines, you would have a continuous feed of glass just pouring out from an orifice in the bottom of a tank that would be cut into different uh, blobs and blown into molds using compressed air. So very, very little human interaction. People often ask us, uh, if we're bummed out as glassmakers that those jobs are taken by machines, and if Lewis had to make pickle jars all day, he'd have no time to do his art. So we're okay that the machines are doing the brunt work, and we're still making these, or have more time to make these wonderful artistic pieces. So here we go, Lewis coming out with a lot more material. Nice big gather. You can see that glow has returned very brightly, and as I said earlier, the color can be very deceptive. You can see some of those glowing very intensely, the clear glowing much less so. It's actually using the block upside down. <laughs> That's the normal way we use the block, like this. However, he really knows how to use all the different tools. He just shaped it up to a little bit more of a taper. You notice that bubble, if you can see it under those color bands, is super tiny right now. It's maybe... Uh, half the size of a walnut. It's a little tough to tell because that glass, just like glass when it's cold, has significant magnifying effects. But he's going to keep gathering until he has enough material to really make that big extravagant external curl that the piece he made earlier, those two mated pieces will fit inside. Using some compressed air to accelerate that cooling process. Just letting that set up. And again, looking at feel. You notice he changes his rate of turning, kind of watching it fall on and off center. Many beginners, they have to watch it like fall on the floor to realize it's coming off center. But as I said, Lewis is our most experienced gaffer here at the museum. He's been blowing glass for 40 years, working all over the world. Uh-oh, we got the big blocks. So typically when I work, I max out with this block. But I see someone's got, I don't even know what size this is. This is an inches, that's weird. An eight inch block, I'm used to the numbers in centimeters. It's like way bigger than my head. Lewis just took what we call a strip gather. Yep. 
and stripped again. He had a little too much glass. He didn't want that much material. So he held it down. Now what he's doing right now is actually picking bubbles out of the glass. Occasionally by the way we gather or just simply from melting the raw materials, we can trap air bubbles in our pot. And sometimes those are nice little defects or uh, little reminders the piece is handmade. But other times they can be kind of unsightly defects in the design. So Lewis taking the time to pull those out. You see, kind of pulled it open with the shears, pulled the bubble out with the tweezers, and cut it all while the glass is the hottest it is the entire working time. So picking those bubbles out is no easy task. I should just leave them there. <laughs> How you feeling, Lewis? Good? Good? You're good. <laughs> yeah. Lewis says it's going well, but he hasn't gotten to the hard part yet. He only just made two, three curl perfectly matched pieces, joined them together, put them in the garage, two color bands, twisted it, three gathers, bubble picking. Yeah, it's not the hard part yet. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the question was about our central furnace. That is, um, inside it is a big ceramic pot we call a crucible that holds about a thousand pounds of molten glass. So he turns in there just like a big pool of molten glass, turns the pipe and it spools up. The furnaces on either side of our stage, those are our reheating furnaces, sometimes referred to as glory holes. And over here you can see uh, G is heating in one, Helen's heating in the other. It's really nice that we have two so we can heat these bits. If both of us were heating in the same reheating furnace, it's, unfortunately sometimes you tag each other. And if the glass is hot, it will stick. You get the bit put on way before you're ready for it. And that central furnace is about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. The reheating furnaces run about 2300. So if you see any of our late night winter programming, our 2300 celebrations, that's where that name comes from, the temperature of the reheating furnaces. Elias, uh, does anyone want to guess what Lewis just used to shape the glass, that thing that's sort of smoking on the bench? Yes, someone's been paying attention. That's newspaper. G's just re-wetting that now. Now, many people here like to say the Corning leader is the best for shaping glass, but I guess we can ask Lewis because he really has blown glass all over the world. Um, what is the best newspaper to shape the glass? There is actually a difference. Some of the newspapers just fall apart when they get wet. Other ones, not so much nowadays, but when they had lots of colored ink in them, they could burn with a kind of a weird smell, leave some scuzz on the glass. So whenever you'd go to make your newspaper, the last sections left were always arts and entertainment and sports. You never, you, everyone fought for the financial section. Yes, you have a question? How do we use the newspaper? Can I see that for one second, G? Yeah. So you can see this is actually, it's a thinner paper, so it's probably maybe six or seven sheets folded up. And then we get it nice and wet. And when the hot glass touches this damp newspaper, <laughs> so here, um, you can see this is kind of damp and soggy. You used to be able to read it. You can see some of the imaging still. But we just get that nice and damp and we kind of shape the glass using it. When the glass, hot glass, touches this damp paper, it creates a blanket of steam. That blanket of steam works as a bit of a lubricating layer the glass rides upon. That effect, similar to if you ever get a really hot skillet and you see the water just bounce on it, it's called the laden frost effect. Fun fact of the day. So Lewis is going to take a break from making glass to go falconing. You see he pulled out his leather glove. Just kidding. He, um, 
It's actually probably going to wear that glove while he does this wrap and rake pattern, the feathering pattern. Earlier I said Lewis, very inspired by these ferns growing up. The Karoo pattern, the ferns and jade carvings from his hometown and those natural ferns they were inspired by. So he wants to apply a color wrap around the out of this, outside of this vessel and then rake through it to create a bit of a fern vein pattern. Lewis has a little bit of color, a two-tone wrap. You can look at that and see one color. The cobalt blue is glowing much more, uh, much more brightly than the honey yellow. And we actually encase that wrap in clear. Cobalt's what we call a soft color. It gets hot and it just wants to work it forever. However, that honey yellow is a very stiff color. You heat it up and then it's cold again, like right away. It sets right up. So by encasing that, by encasing that, we're able to allow it to pull out more evenly. Wonderful view inside a reheating furnace. You can see why it's kind of tight quarters in there. Now watch this. This is one of the cooler things I think you can see in the whole glass making process. This is just like so awesome. Lewis is going to tack on that bit, pull back, and turn, or G's going to turn super, super fast. You can see that thread going on as the thread is pulled thinner. It cools, darkening. Where it's fresh, it's glowing very bright. Lewis stabs it away, <laughs> cutting it free. Isn't that just like, ah, it's so awesome to watch. I love watching it over and over again. Any glass player with an Instagram account knows they'll get the views if they post a video of that. It's like cheap thrills. <laughs> Our social media coordinators just started laughing. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> that's, that, that's that sweet shot right there. Oh yeah, stuff, stuff cups are fun to watch too. <laughs> And they fill perfectly, it's just like, oh, it's like butter. I love it. So Lewis now has, speaking of butter, he's got a butter knife in his hand. <laughs> Many people ask us if we use any weird tools in the hot shop. Occasionally we'll find something at home and say, hey, you know, the jacks and the diamond shears, nothing else does this. I'll bring a butter knife to work. He made sure to get that core a little cold he just wants that surface really hot. If the whole thing was hot all the way through, when he pauses to rake it, he could easily collapse it on itself. Pinching off that bubble or kind of unevenly distributing that mass. So they're working to get this done really fast. So the surface is hot and pliable, but that core is more stable. So this is that, uh, what we call festooning, that feathered pattern. I've all seen people using bent off uh, screwdrivers, a screwdriver someone bent the tip of to do a really detailed rake, but he's going for a lighter pattern like these ferns from his hometown in New Zealand. So for those of you just joining us, this is a special late show demonstration by our most experienced glass artist on staff, Lewis Olson. Let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> oh, shucks. You're making him blush. Or it's just that he's standing in front of a 2,000 degree furnace. We'll never know. So G. Brian assisting Lewis, taking that nice long heat to melt in that surface. So Lewis is actually raking in both directions using that butter knife along the surface of the glass. If we wake and run rake in one direction, it's called festooning, like that drapery or bunting you'll see around 4th of July. If we rake in both directions, it's called feathering. And Lewis said that feathered pattern, again, very common in the ferns from his hometown in New Zealand. Now, Lewis is a truly amazing glass blower. And I remember last summer 
we had our Inspired by Blaschka show, a show devoted to the art of Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka, flame-working father-son duo. And so everyone was making lots of sea creatures because the particular art we were showing by the Blaschkas was their invertebrate models. Lewis, for his sea creature, made a huge marlin, this really beautiful swooped around marlin. They're the ones that sort of look like swordfish, has a big fan down its back. And at the very end, he made a stand for it simply by dropping a blob of glass into our optic mold and swirling it. So you got this kind of swirly star-shaped stand for the marlin. And all of us glass lawyers on staff knew we couldn't make a marlin like Lewis could, but we loved that stand. And by the end of the week, one more glass floor went up to Lewis and said, oh, I loved your optic mold stand. He was gonna quit, I swear. Because he loved, he made this beautiful fish he was very proud of. And everyone was like, yeah, it's an amazing fish, but we're not gonna be able to make that. But you did a really good job with that cookie foot optic mold stand. That was great. <laughs> so everyone was kind of fixating on that. That little Kiwi style move he had. You can see Lewis now marveling and dragging. Eric doing a wonderful job following him with our camera. You can see he's sort of disrupting that raked pattern. As it cools, you can even see that two-tone appearing in the rake or in the, the external wrap. So internal colors are more of a sunset combination. That internal swirl will be a, see a reddish aurora, so like an amber color. And was the other one hyacinth, G? Reddish aurora and hyacinth? Uh, reddish amethyst and yellowish aurora. Okay, sorry, reddish amethyst, so a reddish purple color, and yellowish aurora, so a warm peach amber color. Both transparent on the inside of this vessel. That external two-tone wrap is a honey yellow, so a really, really, really bright, uh, almost translucent yellow, like really bright, and cobalt blue one of our denser colors and one of the most popular colors in our glass making arsenal. Everyone loves cobalt blue. There's a saying in glass making, if you can't make it well, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it blue. So people can't help themselves, they all love this color. But Lewis, of course, with his 40 years of experience, will be able to make you something large, well, and with a little bit of blue in it. So. Real cloud, crowd pleaser right here. Do artists ever use different types of glass for different types of projects? Like, do people ever use... So we had a really awesome question from one of our viewers at home. Do people use different types of glass to make different projects? Most of the time up here, we're gonna work with standard soda lime glass. It's really difficult putting different types of glass all in one piece because they can be incompatible. As glass cools, it shrinks, and depending on the type of glass it is, it'll shrink at a different rate. We call this our coefficient of thermal expansion, our CTE. We actually have a new wonderful program here a residency, a technical residency, where artists can come and sort of sneak into the vault of Corning Incorporated and use all these unique technical glasses to do artistic pieces. There was an artist last year, uh, Anne Malowski, I always pronounce her name wrong, apologies to Anne if she's listening, and she got this glass ceramic from Corning Incorporated and was blowing human-sized pods out of it. I was really excited. I came into work one day and this amphitheater was shut down and everyone had face shields on except one guy, George, did not have a face shield on, just standing there with the safety glasses. And they were using compressed air to blow up these pods human-sized. This glass ceramic is especially tough. If you read our section about glass ceramics, that big baking dish tower in our innovations uh, section. You'll learn more about that material. And that's a really amazing program. Our chief scientist, Dr. Jane Cook, was just out at Pilchuck, I believe. Was she at Pilchuck? She was just at Pilchuck, so one of the top glass blowing uh, schools in the world. 
teaching a class about using various materials in the glass making process, different types of glasses, ceramics, seeing what's compatible, maybe even including metals. So really exciting. Uh, it's very difficult. It can be a very frustrating process to use different materials all in one piece. But some of the work coming out of it is incredibly rewarding and very fascinating. So that was an excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking it. And yeah, keep your eyes out for our technical residency program and uh, other things at this museum and talks by Jane Cook. She's a really wonderful speaker uh, to the art and the science of glass and how the two can be brought together to really uh, make each one better. <laughs> so here we go, those beautiful layers of color. Lewis is letting this set up, which makes me think you might be going for another gather. Lewis, are you gathering on that? I remember today when we were, yep, there he goes. If you look on our screens, you can see Lewis plunging into that furnace. It's a little bright in there. So it's hard to get a good exposure, but there's actually that big ceramic pot or crucible. And we were talking during our lunch breaks about what was going on. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Uh, talking about what was gonna happen today, Lewis was like, yeah, I think I'm gonna make a four gather piece and put two, two gather pieces in it. So it's kind of like eight gathers. And the rest of us were like, okay. And I just said, well, I'm glad I'm on the microphone for that, have fun. But he is an amazing glass maker, incredibly strong. The whole team's really strong, G and Helen. And Lewis, amongst all of them, we probably have close to a century of glass making experience on the stage. About 75 years of glass making experience. Um, the museum itself will not consider taking someone from this position with less than about six years experience. And they say typically it takes about four years to become proficient. Just using this wooden paddle to kind of shield Lewis. The green sleeve on his arm is Nomex. That's a material that they use to line firefighter outfits. Some people use cotton sleeves as well. But this is even more uh, protective. It's really nice that this is on the thicker side right now. You can see all those crazy optics just kind of going, uh, bouncing around in there. I know Lewis doesn't typically tend to keep his work very thick, tends to use all that material and blow it out into really large, impressive forms. But the Scandinavian style in which he was originally trained, their habit is to leave things very thick. You see a lot of clear glass sitting at the base of a vessel. That's what they'd call the ice. It's a good way to spot something from Scandinavia. <laughs> You'll see Lewis occasionally will hang it down to inflate. This is a lot of material, so he might be puffing with a little bit of pressure. Typically, if we're making one of our more standard pieces, You'll barely see the gaffer's cheeks puff out. But as Lewis works, uh, this is a lot of material to move. So he's gonna have to work really hard. So giving himself a little handle right now. To pull this out. 
feel like it's about to get really exciting. <laughs> so you can see right now we have a very contained light bulb shape with a little handle. Yeah, she's excited. I'm excited too. Uh, we have a little light bulb shape, but the final form will be this big looped around curl. So we're going to have to do a lot of drastic transformations to this form to end it up like that. So the part Lewis has right now is the part I uh, sophomorically <laughs> illustrated in black and pink. While we're working on this, Helen's doing a wonderful job. Maybe not the most exciting job in the shop, but a very important one, babysitting the piece in the garage. Now these are those two intricate matching uh, kind of Siamese curls, that fern pattern. The colors he's using on this external part are the same as the colors of these two internal uh, mated curls. Many people assume as glass blowers, it's really our lung capacity that's the strongest thing. That's not quite true. The strongest, or the thing we have to have the most strength in is typically our forearms. So you can see G and Lewis and even Helen having a bit of a more Popeye, Popeye build. A lot of glass blowers are also rock climbers for that intense hand strength. It also takes a very distinctive personality to become a skilled glass maker. I see some people nodding. They're probably glass makers themselves. You have to be very intense, very obsessive. This art takes uh, a lot to accomplish. It's very expensive to rent studio time. It takes a long time to become good. If you want to make your family a nice ornament or your mom a nice picture for Mother's Day, it might take a couple years to pull off. It's a very uh, taxing, very intensive art. You have to really commit to it. So you have to be a little obsessive, but you also have to be a little laid back. You have to be calm, you have to be okay. Things fall on the floor, because that'll happen a lot when you first start. If you're wound too tight, glass probably isn't the right medium for you. So that interesting combination of passionate and obsessive, but also able to let things go. Very unique to glass blowers. So right now we have the whole team on deck, Helen shielding Lewis. G backing up Lewis on turning. You can see G just kind of has this open, like, kitten pawing stance, just kind of rolling the pipe. Lewis is now cutting in a jack line or constriction at the top of the vessel. So this will be uh, where we're going to break it from that blow pipe later on. You want to get that in before it gets too long or inflated. The longer the piece is, long, thin pieces can be very difficult to control. They tend to want to fold. Also, our reheating furnace is open on only one side. The heat spills out the front of it. The back of the furnace is hotter. So the tip of the piece where Lewis is cooling with compressed air currently heats up a lot more. You can see how that part's glowing more brightly than the part up by the pipe, which also functions as a heat sink. So this view is one we're very proud of here in Corning, New York. Uh, that camera is not actually inside a reheating furnace. It would not be very happy. Our AV team wouldn't be very happy if we threw their camera in the furnace. The furnace is running at about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take 100 degrees. Or, sorry, somewhere between 2,100 and 2,300 degrees. That camera is actually behind our furnace, protected by a window of fused silica. Fused silica was invented in Corning, New York by Dr. Franklin High in the 1930s. It was actually invented way before it had a purpose. Fused silica was originally, um, it was experimenting looking at very high purity, high silica content glass. It didn't have a use until the 1950s when NASA came calling looking for a strong transparent material to make windows of the space shuttle. Not only does it protect astronauts, it also protects that camera in the back of the furnace. Um, Eric, in a second, is it possible to get a picture of the drawing? Is it possible to get a, oh, sorry. Wow. 
So in a second, you'll see a shot of the drawing, just what Lewis is making. Those internal blue curls have already been made, and it's that big external piece that Lewis is now sculpting, that foregather piece. So those of you at home, uh, you get a little preview of what we're working on here. Awesome, thank you so much. This is in our standard vessel. These more sculptural elements can be a little difficult to follow. So hopefully um, all of you at home get a little better understanding of where we're going with this. We're sort of flattening this out a little bit. Lewis does these curled shapes a lot. I'm not sure he's ever made anything quite like this with them nestled like that. I know he does these curled shapes quite frequently. He's really pushing their limits, making them larger and more intricate. And he's marking right now um, which side has which color on it and which part he wants to have on the inside of the curl versus the outside of the curl. So that's why he stabbed the moil. He torched the moil and then stabbed it with the tweezers. He'll look for that little indent to know how to orient the piece when he starts to pull it out. Now, Helen wants to make sure that that little nub doesn't get too hot. Lewis later on will grab it with the diamond shears and pull this out. Quite long, I'm assuming. It's a very large piece of glass. You may cut that nub away and grab a second handle out of that end. We'll see exactly how the material is flowing and how the thicknesses in that internal wall are shaping up. Helen doing a wonderful job multitasking, checking up on our garage, also being over here as an attentive assistant helping shield Lewis and chill that handle he's pulled on the bottom of the vessel. Now many people ask us, do we get burned a lot in the hot shop? Uh, if you do, you go find a new career. Maybe you go be a nice sculptor. But a more common problem to have in the hot shop is kind of chronic injury. You'll get occasionally exposure burns. That's why Lewis just dipped his hand in the water and is wearing that sleeve. So from the radiant heat, you can actually burn yourself and blister from the heat radiating off this very large piece. What's more common is actually chronic overuse injuries in your body. So I asked Lewis if he had arthritis or other problems and he just, got annoyed and asked me how old I thought he was. But many glass blowers, even in their 20s, uh, if they're not taking care of their bodies and really pushing the size limits, can, can start to see some side effects from that. Here we go, Lewis, going around the world. You guys picked a good day to be here. We don't, we don't pull out pieces like this every night. It's like dancing, dancing with it. Here we go. Here comes the big pull. And Helen going with that, pulling at the angle. Lewis with his hero pose, bringing that up and around. It's having G blow a little bit. As we pull the glass, it wants to fold. It's hard, you wanna keep some, <laughs> see everyone's like <laughs> clutching their chest. Um, if we uh, have the glass hollow and pull it, it wants to fold. So G will blow a little bit just to make sure this is a smooth, even curve. So pulling out curves like this without getting awkward kinks or folds, very, very difficult. <laughs> Lewis, you using that wooden paddle to sort of press in that curvature. In 
torching up that topper, uh, upper part. Wherever we apply heat to the glass, it's more stretchable. There we go. Oof. That is a lot of glass. Right now we refer to Lewis as the gaffer of this piece. He's the one in charge, so I hear him directing G when to turn. And Helen, where exactly to apply the heat to bring about that form he desires. So you can see earlier why the cameraman and everyone on the team knows to give Lewis a little bit of space. When he comes out of the reheating furnace, he comes out hot and he will really move that material as it needs to get moved. Oh boy, I hope it fits back in there. <laughs> Okay, going, threading the needle with that piece. Very exciting. All right, it's a little big right now, so we're just working off that radiant heat. We're gonna have to curl that further to be able to fit it back into our reheating furnace. Lewis directing exactly where he wants that heated. Helen's got our fluffy torch. So again, that right balance of heat and pressure to not get awkward folds, but get to get that smooth, continuous curve. Well, I guess it's a good thing uh, that, that, yeah, that as Lewis was leaving that shop in New Zealand back in the 1970s, that someone chased him out and said, hey, give me your number, kid. Maybe we could use you around here. Here we go, closing that loop up a bit. Helen, just, just lightly torching that neckline. Remember, we're gonna have to break this off of the blowpipe later on and finish up this curve. He applied those colors very early on in the process. And as they stretch out, they'll become a little uh, more of a wash. So when I was referring to this as a color wash, simply because Lewis chose to work with transparent colors very early on. Now we have that tucked down a little bit more, able to get <laughs> up and personal with the camera in the back of the furnace. Lewis cutting off that little handle part. The torch Lewis just lit is hotter and more focused than the fluffy one Helen's using. Lewis decided to tack that up and around. With a closed form like that, it will be a little easier to control. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bring it out 
So shutting G into the reheating furnace. We want to make sure we build up enough heat on this vessel. Also, the all the doors are open on the furnace. It's like leaving your doors open the coldest night of winter, all the windows open in your house. Yep. You want me to shut you in, Lewis? Or are you good? So you can see Lewis has some laser focus right now. Doing that Lewis dance move. I think I'm going to have to debut that at the next dance party I go to. It's a pretty fresh move. Oh, you guys might be doing the sprinkler or the Macarena. I'm doing the Lewis Olsen. I'm not sure if this top connection, how the piece tacks back on itself, will be the final design, or if it's an easier way to control it. If you have a long, straight thing uh, in our reheating furnace, a long, straight piece, it's very difficult to keep under control if it tacks back down in that cooler anchor point. It's a little easier to manage. Thank you. All that cork smoke. <laughs> People either love the smell of the cork burning or they hate it. It's kind of sweet, smoky smell. Lewis is going in and really pushing that curvature. And G's applying a little bit of internal pressure using his breath. So again, we don't collapse that curve. We keep that nice, gentle, supple form. As this piece gets bigger, it will also get thinner, really accelerating the tempo with which G has to heat. The thinner the glass is, the smaller its thermal reservoir, and the more rapidly it will drop to a temperature where it risks spontaneously cracking. To give you a little more respect for what G Brian's feeling right now, that furnace is running just around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and he's standing only five feet away from it. Think about last time you baked cookies in your 350, your measly 350 degree er oven, and how hot it was when you opened the door. Excellent question. How long do the cork paddles last on stage? Um, I know this is such a cheap answer, but it depends on how much we use them. Yeah, we don't make too many flattened shapes up on stage. Sometimes a flattened shape can have a uh, sort of uneven bottom, so we'll have to cold work it. And people uh, don't typically like to spend the time cold working, which means once it cools, grinding the bottom flat. But the cork paddles are quite thick. Lewis has smaller ones. There's larger ones sitting on the Marver. 
brought out just in case. And the large ones look like they've barely been used. So Lewis now using the calipers to measure exactly where or how that shape he made earlier, that double curled sort of mated Siamese twin shape will fit into this sort of parent curl. Helen now torching this while Lewis runs off to go find a tool. What are you doing there? It's getting hot where you're at? It's a little warm over here. Thank you for asking, G. Yep. That's an important job, running the doors. Yep, I got a really good view of the whole process. I'll call this my workout for the day. You can see we have this beautiful, huge, gradual, even curvature. We don't want to ruin that by smashing a big bottom into it. So instead of getting the bottom really hot, or what will be the bottom of the piece really hot, in our reheating furnace, Lewis is torching it to get a very small, flat spot that the whole piece will rest on. Using our tag or tagliole, that simple metal paddle, he just swoops in that little flat spot. Which will be the base of this big final form. Helen. Helen's now making Helen's now making what we call a punty patch. It's a little bit of glass we're gonna stick on that very base. So almost an insurance policy. This is not a base of the final piece, we'll likely ground that off. Cold work it. I know Lewis doesn't like to cold work, you might just stab it off with a butter knife when it gets cold. Once this piece has annealed for several hours, slowly cooled down in a controlled manner. This is a very thin wall in the vessel, so if we're puntying not on a defined bottom, but kind of on a side wall, we like to put these little patches as an insurance policy to make sure that portion of the vessel is structurally sound enough to be held right there. So 
you can see now, the colors look a little muddy. They'll be incredibly vibrant when true. We're going for that punty transfer now. She's shaping up our punty. It's a very tough piece to turn. You saw he put a lot of glass into it. This is four gathers right now. It's also not circularly symmetric. So it's kind of like driving with a flat tire I compare it to, or riding your bike with a flat tire. A lot of torque going on. So Lewis takes a amazing amount of hand strength to keep this piece turning. If you were to stop turning, it would fall off center. It's also very important to continue turning inside our reheating furnace. Continue turning inside our reheating furnace. You can see on that feed on the right side. And cork the side that I stick up or down. Okay, open. It just bends a little. A little straightening move. Collaborative work between Lewis and Helen. <laughs> Helen assisting and turning as well so Lewis can get a better view of the angles of the overall piece. She's making what we call a cold core punny. These are only typically seen in very large pieces. The core of the punty will be a little on the cooler side. That surface will be really hot and sticky, so we get a good fusing onto this vessel. Not only will the punty have to support... Hi. Hello there. Come here often, Lewis. How you doing? I'm having fun. You're having fun. Well, that's what matters. Lewis having fun, guys. It's all going good. Okay. G's making that cold core punty. This is a special type of punty we use on larger pieces. That external hot surface is really sticky. That cold core gives it a little more size and stability. All things we want. And something that must hold a vessel of this size. The punty transfer is stressful no matter what, especially when you're starting glass making. This is going to be 
an asymmetric shape. With a lot of weight, and a lot of time and color application into it. Sort of lining this all up. You can see exactly why we put that extra patch earlier on. Helen's coming in with the jacks, that jack liner constriction. It's going to be sort of a weak part on that punty later on. Lewis, would you like me to assist with turning the pipe right now? High stepping back into the bench. Helen just torching those more delicate parts. Little tap, and the piece comes free. Oh my gosh. You guys can breathe again. I'm breathing again. Oh, wonderful job by G, Lewis, and Helen. Now that that pop part is just cold enough to break, it was down around about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. This will be a very long heat. We're going to have to raise that temperature up. Not only to fire polish those little cracks, you can see those in our uh, camera feed. We just replaced the window in the back of the furnace. Not only to fire polish that top part where it cracked, we added the water, but also to get it where it's soft and workable again. So this will be a really long heat, raising the temperature along the top of this vessel from 900 degrees to around between 1,500 and maybe even 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. This glass is nice and workable. I said earlier, not only is Lewis an amazing designer, amazing uh, craftsperson, very skilled hands, but he also makes a lot of his own glass colors. He makes his own glass batch, which is the raw materials we add to make clear glass under the name Corning Batch Company. We've actually had the pleasure of working with that material. It's excellent workability for production glass. Sets up pretty quickly. Lewis just peeking around the opening. So you can see how different colors behave differently. That clear uh, connection point where we loop that all around. It's getting pretty wild. It's getting very loose. You can actually watch that stretch and deform significantly faster than the denser colored areas. So you can see why we looped this all around. That clear glass working as a bit of a tether, holding the two pieces right up against each other. And Lewis will trim these top parts away, giving a nice, clean, refined start. For now, he tucks them in even closer to each other to make sure. that he has that good, stable connection along the top. Lewis developing his plan of attack. For how he wants to complete the top part of this vessel. Now, very difficult with these tall forms. It's important that the top is obviously hot enough so they can work it. They must make sure that this bottom, this long, thin curve of the bottom, doesn't get so cold that it can spontaneously crack. So you have to keep the whole thing hot. And finding that 
delicate range where the top is hot enough to be worked, the bottom is hot enough not to move so much. It's very difficult. Zizi Lou is cutting that free. And now here comes all the crazy sculpting again. Sticking the tag right in the piece. There we go. You actually just kind of drop the tag in there. Uh, looked like kind of a funny move at first, but that's a way for him to make sure he doesn't close off that opening. He doesn't want to seal that yet. So it's something for him to sort of crimp down on and pull against. Taking that tag out. Hot stuff. So he pulled that out, separating those top parts. That's fine. Yep. This thing very long. So long it's actually out of focus for our camera. And you can see um, that burner is along the side of our furnace. It's actually hitting this a little lower than where they're trying to shape it. It's not a common problem, but this is actually such a tall piece, it's sort of working past the burners. So this again pulling. You can see why we needed a really big, thick, punty connection. He's basically uh, playing tug of war against G on this piece. Helen using the two torches, one to keep that punty connection nice and hot. The second one to really preheat that tip, which they'll pull out and curl. They used a set of calipers earlier on to measure that internal scroll. to ensure that that initial piece will actually fit inside this form. So you can see right now, you can almost tap the fused silica. You could if you wanted to, I'm sure you could. I don't think Lewis would want you to, or whoever manages that window would want you to tap the back of our furnace with Lewis's piece. But I'm sure you could do it if you wanted to, G. see that beautiful curvature we're building into this form. As I said earlier, it's very difficult to stretch this tubing, especially now that it is open to air. As the tubing gets stretched and pulled, it wants to sort of crease or fold on itself. It doesn't want to pull in a very even design. So Lewis and G are going to have to be really delicate with it. not overheat it so it folds, but getting hot enough they can pull into that good, smooth, even curvature. Earlier, when they were pulling, it was common for Lewis to have either G or Helen apply a little internal pressure on the piece, using their breath to cap it, or capping it with their hand.
Lewis now pulling. You can see the amount of exertion he has to send into this piece. A little compressed air to chill that. With a light tap, it comes free. Pardon me. It's not only important to close these doors to uh, protect G from that heat of that furnace. Remember, this is running, it's a little colder now, so probably around 2,000 degrees. Yes, you're welcome, G. Thank you. But also important <laughs> to make sure that the furnace itself doesn't get too cold. As I said, this is like hanging out with all your doors and windows open in the middle of winter. So instead of a 50 degree Fahrenheit difference between inside and outside, there's a 2,000 degree difference between inside and outside. So Lewis now crimping lower. Where he touched over to connect that other curl, it left kind of an uneven spot in the glass, and so he's kind of pulling that out. Sort of pulling that out to make sure um, that he gets all that nasty, kind of uneven, thick spots out of this design. G and Lewis discussing exactly how they want this done. G is going to heat this once more. Lewis will pull it a little more and then break off that sort of uneven marred top section. Yeah, Lewis, hot metal's hot. <laughs> Lewis will periodically dip some of his tools in the water. They are getting a lot of heat from this vessel. You want to tip down or up? So pulling that out, getting that really nice height he desired. Flipping that around, curling it, and crimping it. So he did a really nice job. There we go. Yeah. Really nice job getting good even pull, nice smooth uniform curvature along this form. I know Lewis sees a lot of uh, fern shapes, that uh, kuru, jade carving type. But right now I see this almost looking like a flame. Now Helen, while G and Lewis are continuing to shape this main uh, external curve, the hammock, of this shape. Helen is watching those curves they made earlier on. So 
to see Lewis really lining that up. Really balancing out that curve. These curve shapes, it's a very subtle difference between a really even balance shape. And something that just looks kind of crushed. Helen's pulling out our little curls, making sure they're nice and flush. Lewis organizing his bench for the big assembly. Lewis likes to use those cork paddles because they create a kind of smooth profile. The cork will also rob the heat from the glass very slowly. The glass is very thin right now, uh, really shortening his working time. G now torching this very elegant, kind of flame-like natural form. Remember those colors are very sunset colors and the top will be a yellow and a blue over that. I really like that point where it's a little thicker on the shorter point. You can see the different layers of the colors pulling out into that nice clear bit of glass. She's making sure to keep this warm enough so that none of it will crack, but not so hot that it changes shape. And there we go, wonderful view, uh, for those of you who joined us later on, of that beautiful kind of Siamese twin fern shape Lewis made. We had one of those before the show. He was kind of preparing the last couple days, practicing in clear. We like working with clear because it's less expensive. If we don't like it, we can just crush it up and throw it back into our furnace to recycle um, as we go. So here we go. Price check. Just seeing where exactly they need to torch so this fits in. Lewis directing exactly where Helen needs to build up heat into the vessel to ensure that this piece attaches. Now when we attach two pieces, we can either use a glue bit, a separate bit of clear glass to drape it in just like glue. However, that can leave sort of unpleasant looking uh, blobs in the form. If we want to make it really clean, we can simply heat and torch the two separate parts and fuse them as Lewis as Lewis did earlier in the process when he fused those two smaller ferns. However, when you torch things, you have less heat. So you kind of risk the fusing not being permanent versus using a glue bit. So cleaner joint, cleaner joint, but higher risk. Higher risk, higher reward right now. with this type of jointing. This will be it. This is going to be when we attach that internal form into this external shape. Here we go, laying that piece in, balancing it with the torch.
light tap. Setting that free. Being careful not to drip water on the piece. There we go. Oof. Quickly back into the reheating furnace. Was anyone else holding their breath? Yeah, I think you were. <laughs> I think the whole front row was. She's going to take a nice, big, juicy flash. like a mommy and me sculpture with little babies in it. Lou's using those cork paddles to sort of wrangle this into exact alignment. It's very difficult. You don't want to put too much pressure because you don't want to um, really crush anything. But you also really need to get the job done fast. This is not a time to sort of hang out. Lewis wants to kind of melt in that little ball right there. They're kind of citing it right now, looking at what needs to get straightened. Kind of balancing this, making sure not to lose any of that nice curves. You can see the tempo and the emotion in the room is a changing and accelerating when people compare blowing glass to playing music. As it's more performative, I guess we will have, hopefully, this beautiful piece to show for it. And while this is really beautiful, I've really enjoyed the process as well. I hope you all have as well, especially when Lewis came out and swung out that big overall form. Now he's trying to, uh, or in the process of cleaning out that little punty, punty connection. Oh, you're doing a great job on the doors. Thanks, G. Just got a little personal affirmation for my door, door using duty. See Lewis now cutting into that helm, being a great assistant, helping to shield his hand. There we go, trimming that clear bit away. Those punties we've been using, we've been using various types of punties. The one on the base of the piece right now is called a cold core punty. It's big, it's thick, it's strong. The punty that we placed up on top of this piece was a sculpture punty. It's a bit taller and it has that neckline that it breaks free from uh, pretty easily, but it can leave that big blob of clear. And unfortunately, just by the design of the shape, 
that punty is kind of in a very prominent space. Typically, we try to hide punties, but there's really no way we could have attached this um, without having that punty right on top. So now we're taking that time, sort of smooth that off, really cleaning up that form. Now we've been torching that top of the curl a lot to get that punty part removed. It sort of straightened slightly, so Lou is working. Just push that down and in, just smoothing it out. Wherever we heat the glass, it sort of balls up. Glass has a high uh, surface energy, so it wants to ball up as we heat it. Just making it a much cleaner, cleaner look. And Lewis says he's also done some flame working where you use a torch to shape the glass. He learned how to flame work while in New Zealand. And while his main focus is glass blowing, actually his main focus right now, unfortunately, is just making sure the shop keeps running. He also, in addition to being a glass artist, glass designer, glass chemist, he's also our, one of our lead techs in the shop. So if something breaks, Lewis's job is to fix it. So really a, quite a renaissance man here making this piece, a jack of all trades, master of you two. Making sure to torch in all those little delicate parts, smoothing it. Lewis is really sticking his hand right down into the middle of this piece. I'm going to guess this vessel in its coolest parts is around 1,000 degrees. At its hottest parts, maybe around 1,300 degrees. And Lewis is right on top of it. Remember, heat rises, so he's really feeling this. Lewis getting a second and third opinion on the curve on the top of this piece. So the museum itself will be closing at 8 p.m. We'll hang out until this piece comes to a finish. Just feel free to feel free to stay comfortable. We're not going to kick you out right at the final part. That would be not so nice. <laughs> You guys stay here, watch for two hours, and in the last 10 minutes, we send everyone on their way. Lewis just doing some refinement to this form. The color patterns on the inside and the outside of the form are all the same. Well, the color density will probably vary. The internal uh, structures were blown out less. And Lewis just touching the glass as well. We have to be very cautious. Even sweat on this glass can cause it to break. So while we are definitely all sweating, we have to be very cautious of it. See those sweat drips can crizzle the glass, causing it to crack. Now on the inside of our furnace, it is lined with a sandy mixture called grog. This is crushed up high fire ceramic. If any glass drips down into the base of our furnace. Molten glass is actually corrosive. It can eat away the walls of our furnace. So we have that grog there, so when it cools like kitty litter, we can pull out any broken glass. Lewis told me a story once of some copper blue glass he saw sitting in the inside of a furnace. 
for a very long time, and after being heated and cooled hundreds of times, being left in that furnace, it went from copper blue, a light turquoise blue, to adventuring, that sparkly glass with the copper crystals in it I mentioned Lewis had made earlier. And finally, little copper balls were actually leaching out of that glass color, and Lewis and I were kind of geeking out about how cool that was. So Helen's suiting up to go to the moon. Uh, we should definitely give it a good torch on the bunny in the foot area. I mean, you can see the burner hits it, but not, yeah, not that well. So G balancing out those heats. Lewis evening out that shape. It's a little bit. But he's really going to be focusing now on what we call flashing the piece down. So bringing it to where it's a much more equal temperature between those parts that are farthest into the furnace and the parts that come out uh, the most are, are, are kind of hanging out of the reheating furnace as we torch it. So Liz just found that clear piece has a little bit of scuzz or mark on it. He kind of wants to cut it free. After spending all this time making this vessel, we don't want to leave that sort of scuzz mark on the piece. You can see exactly where he torched that's so getting a little wild and moving a bunch. Pulling it free and cutting it off. Using those tweezers again, pulling really, really hard to continue that curve. There we go, light tap, that comes free. And you'll just fire polish that in, whether glass breaks hot or at room temperature, it will break sharp. So seeing one more curve, he'd like to change very slightly in that taller uh, external shape. She's going to get a nice long heat. Luckily, this is one of the taller parts of the form, so the part kind of farthest into reheating furnace, that taller horn of the fern or karoo shape. sort of balancing that, bringing it around. Allowing the form to both open and close on itself, almost breathing, depending on which direction she holds the pipe. Lewis is really spending some time to build up heat into that base. Helen's suiting up once more. Lewis crawling under <laughs> limbo champion, Lewis Olson crawling under the blowpipe, getting back into the bench. Dropping water on that pipe. Lots of water on that pipe. Sawing at it with the shears, crimping it. There we go, piece comes free. Into the reheating furnace. Helen will leave it. You can see her gloves are already smoking. She's gonna do that quickly as possible. 
There we go. All right. She's clear. Let's close this up. Oh, my gosh. Huge round of applause for Lewis Olson. G. Bryan on the assist. And Helen Tagler diving into the furnace with the piece. You guys got a standing O. Oh, my gosh. That was wild.